people asked me uh, earlier this year, um, back in January, to do a presentation on uh, how I could how I do hollow forms with holes in them. And we talked about that at, at a meeting of the uh, Learn and Turn crew. And uh, my answer was, well, uh, you know, there's really nothing much different about it. There's some pros and cons. Um, the cons, of course, are you're dealing with likely more unstable wood. Um, pros are you have, as, as uh, Jim likes to say, the automatic shavings ejector, if you have a big enough hole, which is lovely, and a window to look in there and see what you're doing. Uh, this can be amazing while you're turning and you shine a light down and as it spins, you've got enough of a window, you can actually see yourself turning in there, which is fantastic. So, um, of course, the downside of that is when it's finished, uh, whoever looks at the piece can also see inside, which means <laughs> you have to make that inside really nice finish like a bowl, except you're inside a hollow form, which is a continuing challenge. Um, so in further discussion, it became clear what people I think were really interested in was how do you design your pieces? Uh, what, what is your design process? So that's really what I'm going to address. Uh, and in doing so, I'm going to just to give you a preview of what we're up to, I'm gonna talk for a little while, a couple of minutes, and then I'm gonna show you some of my pieces for those of you who haven't seen that many or, or any. Um, it's been a while since we've had our show and tells in person. And then uh, I am going to, using uh, the computer, walk you through mm -hmm. a piece I completed uh, just a few days ago, going all the way from a log to finished uh, piece or an attempt thereat. Um, and bear with me, it's a lot of me talking, so feel free to, to shoot out the questions and, and Rick will interrupt and, and ask or, or ask yourselves whatever, whatever works. So um, without further ado, uh, let me put up on the screen um, a shot of the website where I've got my stuff uh, posted. Here it comes. All right, you're all seeing that? Yep. Great, great. So this is, uh, my wife is a painter and um, and I, of course, do wood turning. And over the fall and winter, we built this uh, website to, to share our stuff. And the reason I'm putting this up here is because it goes to the question of, of, of design. Um, and people have asked me, you know, how, how come your stuff is so varied um, in shapes and sizes and, and look, uh, it's kind of all over the place as you can see from just sort of scanning a, a sample of the pieces. Um, and what I, what I like to say is it's all, for me, it's all about the wood. For me, it's uh, about finding what in a particular piece of wood is, is special and trying to bring that out. And I'll just quickly run through a couple of pieces and uh, talk about those in that regard. Um, so this is a piece of mulberry that uh, I turned a couple of, uh, last year. And as you can see, it has this sapwood on the top and the heartwood. That's the backside of it, which has this beautiful grain. That's the top. And there's the bottom. And um, the sapwood are there is there by design on the top, you know, and that's what I'm gonna get into. Is so sort of how do I how do I get there? I guess is what people are asking me. But then I turn to another piece, completely a different animal, a a uh, piece a of uh, some random root burl that, that I got when I first uh, joined Bawa. And it was this gnarly, misshapen, crazy, uh, spalted, bone dry piece of wood full of cracks and, and, and bark inclusions and everything. But I spent quite a long time looking at it very closely and seeing if I could find one plane across it that would all connect. And honestly, quite by miracle, I did. There's um, 
one dot of CA in here, and that's on that right-hand side where you see that hole and then it meets right at the edge. I put a dot of CA on there and that's it, just to keep it together while it turned. So again, seeing a piece of wood and trying to figure out what to make out of it was kind of the key. But as you guys know, I'm a hollow form junkie. And uh, here is a, um, sorry about the screen wiggling around. I'm just trying to make it big enough. Here is a piece of Buckeye that uh, Brad Adams uh, had. And I, I bought this little chunk from him for like 10 bucks or something. And it's what, seven, seven inches high. The piece itself, the piece of wood was about seven and a half, eight inches high. So I didn't want to lose any of this wood. It looks so cool. So why did I end up with this shape? Isn't that a pretty green? Here's a view from the top. And you can see that it has the classic Buckeyes black spalting or stain or whatever it is. And it's got holes all through it. So again, I had a, a uh, piece of wood it was just a block and the decisions that went into making it look like this involved things like, well, I have this beautiful black stuff and I could have that on the bottom or the top. And I played with it and looked at it and ended up making it on the top. So here's another hollow form. Um, it's Mappa Burl. Uh, it's a, what I wanted to point out here is that it's upside down from the other one, essentially. If you see, if you, if you remember the one where Buckeye Burl, it's large at the top and thin at the bottom and here it's vice versa. Why is that? Again, because after looking at this chunk of wood that I had, I decided in this case that I really like these flames sort of going up and around, whereas the bottom was more just sort of classic burly stuff and actually not that attractive, weirdly enough. If you look straight on the grain from if you were to hold up the piece and look at the bottom, it's okay, but this stuff was much nicer. Hence, long flames kind of look to it. And that's how I came up with that shape. And one more. I do do some bowls when that's what it seems to call for. This is a um, old spalted piece of acacia that I'd had sitting around in the shop. And the sapwood had this all this beautiful spalting all over it. And then the heartwood was a classic reddish brown chatoyant heartwood. If I'd made a um, hollow form out of it, it would have been fine, but sort of top you know, one bottom of different, but this one, I got to do it so that I could see inside it and sort of see the heartwood while looking at the sapwood from the top. So again, design follows the wood is uh, maybe one way of putting it. Um, what I'm going to talk about are uh, what I call decision points. You know, wood turning is a reductive art, as we all know. Once you take that wood off, it's gone. And therefore, I find that everything I'm about to tell you in a way is really obvious, and we all do it all the time. But what I'm going to try to emphasize is to try to consciously, what I try to do is consciously think of the moments where, okay, I'm making one of those reduction moments of the wood, and where I go will dictate what I can, what options I have. So think about the options first, and those are your decision points. Don't take them for granted. Don't assume what you're gonna make when you're first looking at the wood. Figure it out as you look at the wood, if that makes any sense. So I'm going to change shares and go to the presentation. Any questions so far, folks? I don't see any in chat. All right. All right. 
So as I call this a walk through my creative process, and I thought, well, you know, I don't want to just talk at people and show them stuff. Let's see if I can turn a piece from beginning to however far it gets and um, talk through the process as I go. There's no way I could do that demonstrating it because I, I don't work that fast for them. We're going all the way from a log to finished piece. I'm not even sure. Well, I'll take it back. John Cobb probably could do it, but, but uh, I'm no John Cobb, that's for sure. So I'm going to walk you through the piece, um, the process from beginning to end. And in doing that, a couple of things, the themes I'm going to hit on. One is I have this saying, in addition to it being all about the wood, I have this saying, it's the last 2% that matter. It's the last 2%. And what that means is don't be content with what you got unless you really, really like it. <laughs> um, it's worth it. It's worth the risk. All right. So I started off with Hollywood Juniper. Um, this isn't the actual bush I started with because by the time I got to it, it was down in a uh, street down in the neighborhood. They had already cut it all down, but I remembered seeing it. And this is more or less what it looks like. And what you see is a lot of trunks is a, basically a hedge. It's not a regular old tree. Some Hollywood juniper is a tree. This is more of a hedge or a huge bush. And that's what they had in their full front yard. And they took it all out. And I walked by and I saw these chunks of wood lying around. So the question is, what to do with it? As I said, I have this notion of design points. And let me just review these. They're basically six processes or six steps. You know, when you go from the tree, like we're just looking at, to a log. Which log do you want? Which, which piece of that tree do you have? We don't always have that luxury, but once in a while you do, and it's actually really fun. Now, I'll try to talk loud over the saw. Next one is, you have a log, you're going to turn it into a blank. You know, you cut out the chunk you're going to make your piece from. Question is, what are you seeing in that wood that's worth turning into a blank? Then you refine the blank on the lathe or a bandsaw. You know, you can make the classic circle around it. You can make a bowl or, or you do it with your bandsaw, bandsaw or do it on the lathe. And um, depends on the wood. Can you hear me over the uh, saw? Hey, Rick. No problem for me. Okay, good. Number four is, okay, you've made your, your blank, you've refined it down a bit, then you put it between centers, we all know the drill, you carve a tenon, you rough out the shape, you turn it around, you put it in the chuck, you refine your shape, you hollow it, you part it off, and you finish. Okay, so what's the big deal? Well, each one of those, there are decisions that you have to make that uh, we all make, whether we consciously make them or not. And again, the idea here that I'm sort of... Uh, bringing out in terms of the way I work is um, I try to do them consciously and really stop and think. All right, so let's take them one by one. Tree to log. You saw the tree. And here you see the logs that came out of that tree. What the situation was is I went by this neighbor's yard and they had already cut all the juniper down and it was strewn with the remainders of, of, the, of the trees. And I picked the three biggest pieces and put them in my car and brought them home. And as you can see, they're quite different from each other and they each have their attributes and their limitations. So let's take a look at uh, each one of them a little more closely. So here's the most obvious chunk, I think. It's compact, uh, meaning it's, it's uh, not quite so crazy a shape, um, but it's still got a lot going on. It's got uh, a fair amount of depth and width to it. Also, I like the fact that there's a crotch there. There may be some feathering there. If you look closely at the bark there, you can see some rippling going on. Also, the juniper must have been lying uh, really upside down to how we're looking at it and started growing roots out of this part of the branch here. There's a good chance that underneath that there is a place where the roots were growing which would give you maybe some really nice little bird's eye uh, effect of the knots or maybe some kind of distortions which would be nice to look at. So this is a promising piece. Let's see what else we've got. Here is what's uh, 
the heaviest of the three. Um, a lot going on. You've got uh, multiple crutches at the one end. You've got those three at the top, including sort of a little mini double crutch there. Who knows what's going on in that part of the wood? At this end, you've just got all kinds of twists and turns. The piece is not as thick as it is wide, like we're looking at it. When you turn it on the side, it's actually much thinner. So um, that too has a lot of possibilities, a lot of challenges as well. A very interesting piece of wood. And finally, this one, which uh, is sort of longer and thinner than the other two, um, doesn't look as immediately promising because you couldn't really fit a bowl in there of any size. Maybe in that sort of hump in the middle, you might get something interesting with lots of uh, knots uh, from the different branches coming out. Of course, they may crack, uh, but not very big. Or more likely, I could see putting in a piece that goes along that trunk that you're seeing on the left side there. Uh, they would have to be a vase type shape, of course, but it might be really nice with those sort of twisting, curling things happening at the bottom there. So also an interesting piece of wood. So taking some time to really look at them, doing some more measuring. Again, I find that uh, handling the wood, measuring it, getting a real sense of what's where, um, taking the time and really looking at it makes all the difference. So I've done that, as you can see, I'm taking my time here. And then at some point, you gotta make a decision. Which log should we use? Well, I did eventually go forward and picked one. Drum roll. Here's the one I picked. Um, the other ones were similar. Uh, one was sort of smaller and chunkier and would have been a more obvious choice. One was kind of thin, but very gnarly and interesting. I went for this one and let me give you guys a look at uh, what it looks like in three dimensions. Hopefully this will play smoothly on your screens. Yeah, it looks good. You can see there's a big, big center crotch there and then a smaller crotch up at the top. So you can see the crotch there is interesting. And here at the top, right under my hands, there's actually two other crotches and some really nice curved wood throughout. Um, so I spent some good amount of time deciding what, what, where, where did I want something out of this? So another way to put it is, what's so special about this log? Well, get up close and look at it, personal kind of idea and Here's what's so special, I thought, was if I look at this crotch, and depending on the resolution of your screen, if you look at the bark there, you can see that there's feathering. I flip it over onto the other side of this crotch, and there you can really see it. Oh, yep. See, and that, you know, it's all shaggy. I cleaned it off and I thought, oh, that could be pay dirt. You know, where you see that on the bark, it's usually something inside there. So I'm kind of aiming in on this and We've done it, we've selected the log. And now we're gonna go from log to blank. Okay, we have the patient etherized upon the table. A little literary reference there. Um, and I start marking it up. Here's from the other angle. And there's that crotch and you see the purple chalk. You also see I took a big compass with a with a felt point pen on it, uh, and with a, made some circles on it to kind of get a sense of, okay, what if I did a platter? I mean, platter is a logical choice for a crotch piece or possibly holoform if it's thick enough. So if I'm gonna go that way, I wanna make sure at least I don't cut that option out. So I started making lines. You can see that I erased some of them, like on that right side there, you can see I went further out and that, no, no, actually there's some nice wood up there. I don't need to cut that far out. Let me cut a little further in. Ditto on the top, I've got several lines as I'm sort of judging, well, that chunk on the top itself is actually a nice piece of wood. So if I can save what I want, but also get two or three other pieces out of it, cool. So there's a lot of playing back and forth, thinking I might be doing the following types of things, but I don't know yet. Maybe a platter, maybe a bowl, maybe something else, but I might also want to save other wood. Finally, you have to make a decision and I ended up with those cuts. 
There we go. Cut off the right side. I look inside and I like what I see. Um, this, this wood is really an intense, beautiful color, classic Hollywood juniper, that sort of purpley red color. And um, that's actually a pretty accurate rendition of the color, by the way. That's the pith down there. Yep, see the pith down there, exactly. It's starting to look like I got a pith, I got nice wood. The sapwood looks really dry and it's kind of, I see a crack there in the top. Sapwood may be an issue, you know, but maybe that's because it was cut, cut across it. I don't know, so it's starting to take all of this in. There's the other piece that came off. That's entirely possible. It'll be another piece in itself at some point. I've got it waxed up now, we'll see. Take off the other little limb. I like what I see, kind of really cool swirly stuff. Two piths, so that's the bottom of the crotch. That's where the two piths come out. They almost meet there. And so now I have my, what I call rough blank. I still haven't decided where I'm going with it yet, but I've cut out, cut out, I've cut off a lot of options, but I'm trying to leave myself options. And here you can have a look at it in three dimensions. Well, it's got some issues, but it's also pretty interesting. As you can see, it's got sort of a big, it's much thinner on that side. It kind of caves in on the bottom there. So that may be an issue because it's really thin there at the bottom. How thin, I'm not sure. And I'll tell you something, folks. It's incredibly deceptive how big or small a piece of wood like this is when you're looking at it in three dimensions. Um, it's, I find putting my hands on it like here yeah, so here I'm look, starting to look at the wood and trying to make a decision, where am I gonna go with this? And I see that on the top of the crotch, as there often is, there's a sort of infolded area, that crack that's gonna be a bark inclusion. I also see a piece of rot coming out there on the right. They may be connected. So I don't wanna work in that area. I don't like the looks of that top bit there. So how about whatever I make out of it, I don't wanna be working in there. I might take it off, which I did. And that's what you see now. I cut the top of the whole thing off and there's that crack and sure enough, there's a bark inclusion. Can't tell whether it connects to that other piece, that other rot or not. And I'm also seeing those two pits, which I've outlined in the purple chalk on the right and the left. I don't really wanna work with the pits because I know this kind of wood, the, the cedars and the junipers and so on, those pits crack like crazy, unless you're dealing with you, in which case they don't, I've discovered. So I'm outlining the, finding the pits at this end, getting more of a feel for the wood, measuring it. And it turns out that thin part at the bottom, it's not so thin after all. And I had to kind of measure it to find it. Putting your fingers on either side is a big chunk of wood. It doesn't work. So, hey, I actually have more possibilities than I thought. See, it's in that really what looks like a real depression, but it's a bigger piece of wood than I thought. And so I'll mark up the pits. I draw a line down to the other end of the pits there. And I'm gonna take those off because I don't wanna be working there. And I still got a good chunk of wood in the middle. As you see back here, see my circle? You can barely see it there from the compass. I'll slice some of that off, but I'll still have plenty if I wanna do a big bowl or a platter. All right, so ready to saw. And took off the sides. Beautiful wood. That's how I love these moments, you know. And there you go. They're gone. So here is my further refined blank. We're narrowing down our options here, but I've still got uh, all kinds of possibilities because I got quite a bit of wood here. I'm also noticing, you know where I took that top off? Remember we were looking at the feather on the bark? Well, looking at it straight down into the top of the crotch, if you will. Look on the right, each side of that crack, there is a very fine fiddleback. So that tells me that that figure we saw in the bark goes all the way down, at least through the sapwood. 
and maybe into the heartwood, which would be really nice. So I'm starting to think, ooh, I like the top of this piece too, even with this crack, because I want to capture some of that fiddle back. Again, kind of checking out dimensions. And in this case, I'm thinking, well, what if I made a piece that, what if I made a piece that is uh, lengthwise? And you'll, I'll show you what I mean by that. So I want to see how thick this is and then translate that thickness to the other side. Because of course, whatever we turn, it's a circle. So it has to fit within all three dimensions. So I measured how wide it was and I marked that off on the other side. So I know what my options are. You see, this is the narrower side of that same piece of wood we're looking at. You can see a little bit of the chalk there on the left side we're just looking at. And if I'm going to do a piece that's oriented vertically in this piece, in this, this piece of wood, say with the opening at the top or flipping it over and the opening at the bottom of what we're looking at, then it can't be any wider than what we're seeing here. And that's why in the previous slide, you saw me measuring uh, on the wider side. What I've done is I take the dimensions here, looking horizontally, and I transfer those around to the other side. And that's what you'll see in the next slide, where I can then look at what my maximum width of my piece is, given I'm drawing a circle vertically through this piece. Here, let's take a look at that. And there I have marked what a bowl would look like. And then using those marks that I just made by measuring how thick it is, that's essentially the white chalk there, sort of yellowish chalk there, is an outline of the other side of this piece, if you're looking at the side of it. In other words, I can turn vertically in this piece within those yellow lines, because I have enough wood. Does that make sense? This is a really kind of important point, because. A lot, of a lot of people don't think of turning in a different direction than is obvious. I mean, the obvious, <clears throat> excuse me, the obvious direction that you think of turning here is a bowl or a holoform or a platter going, you know, in that where the purple, where the purple line is. But, uh, and that's maybe perfectly great, but there's also the option, this is a pretty big piece of wood of doing something that is not in that direction, but the top is where we saw that beautiful fine fiddleback show that up on the top of the piece. How about that? So then I turn and I outline what my dimensions permit me to do. So I got to make a decision. We've converted the log into a rough blank and now we got to refine the blank. That means putting it on the lathe and doing that circle or putting it on a, excuse me, putting on the then so cutting that circle out or cutting it on the lathe by the other dimension. My decision? Yeah, I'm gonna go for it. I'm gonna do the vertical thing instead of another round platter-like or hollow form shape that I've been doing a lot of. I think there's something really interesting in that feather coming down the piece with that uh, Fiddle back at the top. But wait a second, this way up. Big at the bottom, sort of a teardrop shape. Or I can go with the big top and more sort of a classic vase shape. So those are the choices I'm starting to mull over now that I've decided to cut those sides off. But I don't need to make a decision about that yet. Just looking down the tracks, but without deciding too early because we still have to get this guy in the lathe. And um, yeah, I like what I'm seeing so far. Get it on the lathe and uh, refine it and see what we've got further before making a decision. Don't cut off your options before you need to is another way of putting it. Get it on the lathe and I start poking at this uh, little bit of uh, bark inclusion with a uh, dental pick and I, whoa, this guy goes halfway in there. And measure that and hold it on the outside. And that, that bark inclusion goes almost halfway across the thing. So hmm, that means I'm gonna have a uh, unstable piece of wood, but also maybe really interesting piece of wood with a hollow form with a hole in it as we originally discussed and people wanted to know about. So we'll see where we're going here. And by the way, folks, I genuinely don't know where I'm going at this point. I'm telling you as I did it. 
So I uh, drill a uh, countersink, a spot for the uh, life center and for the, uh, 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 what do you call it, uh, drive point. Um, my words are failing me. Um, drive center. Drive center. Yeah, thank you. And I put one on a piece of wood like this. I do it at both ends because this thing is unstable. It's big. And I really don't want that thing flying out on me, cage or no cage, face shield or no face shield. So I've, as you see, drawn some circles. I've decided whether I go a little more this way, a little more that way. I pick the circle that's more towards the back there and um, go for it. Drilled it top and bottom, put it on the lathe. Now, in this instance, I put the live center where that big crack is, where that bark inclusion is, because it's taking less stress. The drive center is where the, the work is happening and I don't want that digging into that crack. So just really because of pure practical safety reasons, do some turning there. Hey, look, I figured it's a wood turning demonstration. I have to have somebody turning somewhere along the way here. Um, by the way, my grip on my tool there is not my usual grip. I have put my hand on top of it, but I'm holding the remote control for the, uh, the camera. Uh, and then stopping frequently to have a look at what do we got? What do we got? Where are we going? Where am I going to go with this thing? Right now, I'm still just roughing it out, defining the blank. Here's a close up of where we are part way through. So I have a piece of bark still on there. But sure enough, the sapwood has got a big old crack in it, but it doesn't go into the heartwood, which is good news. And I have that bark enclosure. And sure enough, I've got the stuff in the top and the bark enclosure on the side. And my guess is that they join. The chances are very, very high that those two join. And I have this one. No, I'm so sorry about the sawing, you guys. Hold on. I have this one uh, bridge there of wood between my fingers. And I'm going to leave that for the time being. Because once I cut through that, the whole thing has a crack all the way down it, and then it's far more unstable. So let's let's turn a little more, but leave that there, leave that bridge. And there I've turned it way down, but you can see I've left a big old lip on the top there where that bridge was. Here's what we've got now. And see the crack does not go all the way to the top, which I like. I have no idea what I'm going to do with this thing. It looks like a sort of elongated flower base at this point. But I'm kind of liking the figure and the color. And look at this uh, beautiful figure coming down the sides here. So I've got a piece of wood that I like. And I look down and I also like the shavings, you know, it's, that's when that's the moment where I thought, damn, I love this. Okay, so we now have a, a refined blank. What next? No, I'm so sorry about that noise, you guys. And if you can't hear me, Rick, let me know, okay? I'm gonna lean right in here. We, we can hear you pretty well. Okay. Um, so again, just classic wood turning between centers, turn the tenon and rough out the shape. So it's an interesting blank, beautiful wood, got issues, <laughs> I would say, but what to make of it. Okay, folks, here's where it gets a little uh, different. I know there's some people who do this, but this is where I get out my, my dot pad. This is what the paper looks like up close. And I outline almost every piece I do. Now, I, I can feel the eyes rolling as I speak like, oh my God, this guy is a little bit too compulsive for me. Um, yeah, 
But you know what? I have maybe some people got it. Maybe you know, Kelly Dunn or uh, Mike Tchaikovsky or someone who's been doing this for years can, can, can do those curves on the lathe and wing it. I can't. And I always... I'm the victim of the reductive art of wood turning because I turn something off and I go, ah, I just ruined the curve. And there's, you can't put it back. I find if I outline it, I can really take my time to figure out what do I want? And again, I haven't even decided what's gonna, this thing's gonna be. Well, I outlined it, but it has this major figure and this major issue. Well, that's gonna be part of my decision-making process. So I add that to the diagram. And I you know, so mark that where the sapwood is, which I'm kind of leery of, it's prone to cracking. So I'm, what can I make within these constraints is what I'm getting at. I got a little dotted line though that shows that there's a crack inside there that ends up coming out. So watch out for that collar. This is what I have to work with. Can I make something out of this? Or maybe it should be this. Again, always looking at it all dimensions. Remember turning that piece upside down before. Should it be a teardrop or should it be a vase? Well, I'll try doing some outlines. I just put it, get a pencil and start drawing some shapes on there. Now, these are actually two different ones. See here on the top is more sort of a very low shouldered a piece, and I've done a few of these turnings. I didn't show one specifically earlier, but uh, sort of what I call a Brancusi type shape, or more of a real shouldered shape, maybe something sort of Chinese kind of a vase, something like the, um, the uh, piece I showed you made out of Buckeye. But again, what about this side? What about this way? So again, I could do sort of a Brancusi type thing, but it's awkward because the shoulder wants to be in the upper third, but that's in the sapwood and I'm losing all this good feathery figure at the bottom. Get out the eraser. <laughs> By the way, if you guys need erasers, this is the best stuff ever. I got a box of these things. Reshape it a little bit. Okay, I like that better. And so I've ended up with, you know, various ideas. But I don't know what to do. Uh, so go back to the wood and before I pick one, really, really look at this guy carefully. It's this way, sideways. And then I noticed something. And this was my, one of those decision points for me. Here we have it, the upside down one on the left, where you know it's thin at the top, thick at the bottom. The right way is the sort of the flower pot direction, right side up. It's the same side you're looking at. I've just rotated it 180 degrees. And I don't know if you guys could see this on your screens if it's clear, but it's not an illusion of the photograph. The feather figure, this rippling figure in that incredible color wood is much more, visible when it's on the right side there, when it's quote, right side up with a lip at the top. It sort of disappears just because of the way the light plays on it. That's it. To me, that was the decision. This is a much more interesting piece of wood with this on the right side being the right way up. I take a little more look at it. Okay, I'm gonna have to deal with this thing at the top then. So what do I make out of a piece that's this shape, this sort of funky long flower pot with a rim around the top that holds the top together? There's the, that's the, that figure I wanna to try to get some of. Get out the, uh, <laughs> get out the eraser. Erase your old lines. You can still see some of the shadows. Once in a while, I'll just re retrace it, but I try to do, not make more work than I need to. And, how about I make a line that I, I keep because I wanted to keep that collar up there because it's solid wood and gets me past that bark inclusion that comes out on the side and the top, but I don't want them to join up. So how about I make a piece that keeps the collar? This is something I've never done before, but hey, I'm just seeing where the wood goes. 
second line. I didn't really like that curve, came right down to a point at the bottom. That's no good. So I put in that second line. Get out the eraser, <laughs> erase that first one. And I'm starting to like it. I think this is going to be it. I'm going to make some kind of a vase like shape. Now, by the way, this is an important point. Now I put the tenon in. We all tend to slap that piece on the lathe, say this is going to be the top, this will be the bottom, therefore I have to carve my tenon, flip it around. And have you really, really thought about which way is up on this piece? I mean, sure, sometimes it's obvious, but a lot of the time it's not. And I've seen pieces where I looked at it and I go, oh, you know what? I would have done it upside down. The other way is a much nicer piece of wood. Like that feather, there's no way to see that feather until I had done the refined blank and then looked at it and then commit yourself. Because again, reductive art, once you carve that tenon, you've used up that wood. I have actually, at least one occasion, changed my mind after the fact, took the tenon off and put it on the other end, but you, you know, you lose an inch of wood. This is still a close up. So I'll actually draw in the tenon because it really helps me visualize where I'm gonna go with this piece. Get out the eraser, adjust it. So that it really fits the tenon thing now. And see if I really like those curves. And let me just digress for a second, folks. It's not really a digression, but curves. Um, you know, you can say, well, yeah, I just normally turn a blank that I get and uh, it's already been, someone's done it on the, on, the, on the bandsaw and it's a nice round blank. That's great, I've done many of those myself. And the thing that you're gonna make out of it seems obvious, I'll make a bowl. Okay, that's great, but there are a million bowls or a million different hollow forms that you could make in there. Does your bowl curve inwards at the top? Does it curve a little OG shape or not? And we all make these decisions, but I guess what I'm saying is whether or not you do the dot paper and all that, maybe it'll drive you nuts, I don't know. Um, but if you don't do it, do it, Take your time looking at the piece of wood and deciding up front what you're aiming for. And even if you don't think you're a drawing person, and I'm not, I cannot draw to save my life. I suggest try this, but partly just to see what it looks like when you do different curves, like you saw earlier where I raced the one curve a couple of times. And it can be really amazing how different the thing looks depending on a very subtle like, where does it touch the widest point? Is it high up? Is it down? Is it at the golden mean? You know, where, where does this thing bulge out? So that's my spiel on curves. And just, I really suggest that next time you have what you think is a boring blank, sketch the outside of it, trace the outside, and just play with pictures inside that blank and see what you come up with. And if you have something with bar conclusions or something, then definitely. That's how you end up with, for instance, on the Buckeye piece with the Holes at the top, not the bottom. Okay, I got my left side there. I don't always do this, but I find I can only draw, you know, in that direction. So I flip it over. The beauty of the dot paper is I put little dots to guide me along because it's symmetrical. That's why I do a line down the middle. And I just, you know, like fill color in by the dots, you know, like coloring by numbers and get more or less a symmetrical thing. Or you can just do the other half and, and use that as your guide. So what am I gonna do with the top? Do I make a small opening, like a you know, small opening with a hollow form or do I make it an open thing? I decided because of that big bar conclusion crack on the top, I'm gonna turn around that like so, so I don't have to deal with it. And this is a shape I've never done anything remotely like this before, but this is what the wood ended up with. All right, so got it on the lathe. Time to turn a tenon. There she is. Piece is just the same piece we saw before, but with the tenon on it now. Done. So what we normally take for granted as a sort of just a quick part of, you stick it on the lane, to learn a tenon is actually one of your design points. Again, a sort of that's my whole thesis here is there are these points where when you make those decisions, you are, whether you intend to or not, designing your piece. So why not do it intentionally and hold off on what you don't need to do, like which end is the tenon until you're sure which way you're going.
Next, classic, reverse it, put in the chuck and refine the shape. We've already determined the basic shape. I've diagrammed it, hollow it and part it off. You know, at this point, a lot of the actual design has been done because we did the diagram and we, we've chosen where we're gonna go. And now it's a matter of execution. And so now I'm gonna go a little bit faster through some of the slides and just show you as we zip through it, making that plan come to life. And, you know, there's the old uh, saying, I think it was the German uh, General Klesowitz, uh, no plan survives contact with the enemy. Um, true, that's for sure, but it's better to have a plan and change it than no plan at all. And I've changed these things many times, something, a crack develops or oops, you remove wood that you didn't mean to, and then, you know, you got to play with it. But it gives you a roadmap that ends up, I think, in a better result overall. Here, what I'm pointing out is that on my diagram, I, I, I put little notches where I want the widest spot and where I want the narrowest spot, and I mark those on my piece. Put the cage down and get turning. I recently got this curved uh, tool rest and I love it for something like this. So what's going on here? Feel your pieces, folks, you know? Curves, turning, getting these curves to be really, really nice. You know, a Brad Adams type curve, as I call it, is incredibly hard. And one of the ways to tackle it is to feel it. You can often feel the little shoulder there, the little flat spot that you can't see. And that's what that is. I felt that one. I couldn't actually see it, but I could feel it. So I got the pencil out, figured out where it starts and where it ends, put two lines on there, and then Get out the good old Abernet and refined everything until that got curves just how I wanted. Phew, all right. Take off all this stuff on my head for a little while. And I'm done with the outside. So at this point, I put a coat of wipe on poly on my pieces, especially if it's green or partly green wood. And this is fairly, fairly dry, but it's still technically, I would still call it green wood. It was from back in January. And um, I actually use a wood uh, moisture meter and I make a note of what the wood is. And I got you guys are thinking, oh my God, this guy's so compulsive. I've done it because I can't remember that kind of stuff. And over time I figured out where the sweet spot is. And this blank was between 15 and 19% moisture content once I took off the outer surface. And that's actually is the sweet spot I find for most woods. So in the upper teens, it's still got some moisture. It's a little less dusty. It's more, much more forgiving. When it gets below 15% in our climate here, it's dry, it's dry. And you get below like 12% and it's bone dry. So um, just so happens this was at a good spot. So I put a coat of wipe on poly before I hollow because as you hollow, it's drying and it's cracking. And something like cedar is a very light wood and it wants to crack like crazy. So you can see on the lathe there, a couple of years ago, someone in the club, I'm sorry, to, I don't remember who it was, brought in these, uh, these magnetized sheets that were some kind of an ad and they had a surplus of them. And you put that on the lathe and because it's magnetic, it stays put. So I slapped that on there. And I put some wipe on poly on it, just a few coats, just, you know, let it soak in, give it 20 minutes to more or less dry. And it also is a nice moment when you then see what the wood does. It just begins to pop. I haven't done really fine sanding. I've done, you know, pretty fine sanding. I can do that later. Um, I usually go ahead and sand uh, at this point up to, um, you know, 320 or so grit more if I feel like it, um, because I'm not gonna be coming back to that and it's gonna warp when I turn it, it gets much harder to sand. So you're investing time and energy into it that maybe on a piece that blows up and we'll see here, um, but then you're done. And it's so easy to do it on the lathe. And wow, look at that. By the way, the color is not too far off from how it actually looks. <laughs> it's a little more intense and purpley, but um, I've never seen anything like it before. That's, 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 you know, that's what makes your wood turner's heart to start to thump, at least for me. Okay, we have the, uh, the gooseneck lamp out. And um, 
If any of you are hollow for, form turning and you don't have one of these, you need to get one. They're hard to find that have, see how that's a very thin top on there? Most of them, the mechanics lamps, the end is quite thick and that's no use for a hollow former. So again, I'll send all these stuff out. We'll attach it, uh, we'll post it later. But um, this is the one, you find that online. And man, is it nice. Okay, this is a long piece stuck in the tenon on the end. So I'm, I'm using the easy rest, which is fantastic by the way. Cannot, cannot say enough about it, it's great. Absolutely does what it's meant to do. I haven't had a piece come off since I used it. Start uh, removing, basically hollowing, even though it's very wide, it sounds weird to say hollowing, but it's hollowing. And then just like any other hollow form, make your life easier by drilling a core. I actually drilled, since the opening is so wide on this thing, I drilled with this bit and then with a, um, a one inch spade as deep as I could go. Hey, if I can drill it, I'm not gonna waste my time hollowing, it makes your life much easier. It's starting to get hollowed. Design, design, design. Again, I'm not doing much new designing at this point, but I'm watching something like the top. What do I want the top to look like? I leave it fairly thick to begin with, but as I studied it, I decided, okay, I want the top to be right about where that edge is, because I like a little bit of that in curve on the top. So don't go past that, Steve. And now you can see I've actually taken that bit, that bit of the edge off on the wood. Any questions, by the way? I'm just chattering away here, but we'll make sure. You still there? Looking, looking great. Still okay. here. All right. And now I'll just, uh, this doesn't really have to do with design per se, but hey, we're into it and everyone wants to see how it's done. I start off with a Joukowsky tool with his scraper, a wonderful tool. That's how it looks from the side. This is the long scraper. It's a new, he just added that to the system. Good old Abronet. Look how it's looking. I think this is looking, I get really excited at this point. This is so cool. I've never done anything like this before. Now I'm getting into where that narrower neck is. So I got out the Jameson system and there is the whole rig. And I'm gonna leave it up for a second in case anyone uh, has not used one, has any questions about it. Um, and this is actually the first time I've used it with his, his bore. He has a pretty heavy rod on there and his cutting tip is on this swiveling gizmo at the end, all of which is way too thick for the, for the openings that I usually do. But this time, obviously I have this trumpet of an opening, so I really liked it and I could adjust it well. And I, this is the first time I used his, his boring bar and the cutting tip on the end. What I've done is I've adopt, adapted it to fit the Joukowsky tool. So the big size Joukowsky I can use with the rig. And that's a wonderful combination. Any questions about the Jameson rig? Don't see any questions. Okay. One thing is that the, the stand at the right end only has that one uh, turn screw to hold it. I think it should have two. It's not stable. Mm -hmm. um, and I have to actually use a, uh, a wrench to tighten it hard enough to keep it steady because the rough wood turns and that thing starts moving around on you and it's really scary. So a little design defect in my opinion there. Here it is looking into the piece. Here it is. Notice on the right there, I've got the uh, gooseneck lamp and I actually duct taped it or not duct taped, I painter taped it onto the rod so I can just tear it off when I'm done. But that's really nice to have that light right where you want it. And this is cool. The wood uh, bark is falling through there is a, and I'm actually looking into the piece. And on the top there, you can see the dot from the laser beam from the Jameson rig, which is telling me that I'm not near the edge. And that's because right now the rod is just sitting in the middle of the piece. Toothbrush, useful tool. Get those shavings out. Dental pick pushing that stuff out that I, so I can see into the piece and see how it's gonna really look. 
and I'm liking it. I'm liking it. You can see the light coming through from the left side and the right side, there's also a bark inclusion that fell out. And you're looking through the right side of it too. So there's holes on both sides of this thing. But you notice the crack comes up and sure enough, I was able to preserve that ring around the top of solid wood. All right, I am finished hollowing. And now I got the uh, patient on the table again and my, my scalpel on, on the right side there, and we're gonna part this thing off. And there you go. It turned into a, uh, uh, some kind of a vase. And I didn't show it to you, but I took some time to figure out where to make that parting cut. Should I make it where the vase comes to the bottom there and then the tenon kind of block there? Usually I would cut it off there because it's more elegant, but then it looked like it would tip over. So I decided to use some of that as a little base. And there you go. What are your final dimensions? You know, I haven't measured it. However, I happen to have the piece right here. I had it hidden away because I didn't want you guys to see it. You know, I got to have some suspense here, you guys, you know. <laughs> I've got the piece right here. Final dimensions are inches. It is a little nine and three quarter inches tall. And the opening of the top is uh, five and a quarter inches wide. But are we done? Yes, yeah, so a few words about finishing. You know, I said I have this phrase, the last 2%. Um, you know, throughout this uh, process, I'm constantly pushing myself. It's so easy, for instance, when you're getting well into it, especially, you know, you're well into your hollowing or you're well into doing the inside of your bowl. And, you know, you could go a little thinner, but, you know, it looks pretty nice. And, oh, what if I ruin it? We all wrestle with that. I have no doubt we've all had that thought of, you know, it's, it's okay, good enough. I like it. It's, it's, it's good. But, you know, is it? Is it really good enough? Um, that last 2%, I think, is what makes a good piece into a really good piece. And I think you, you would all agree. We've all looked at pieces from across the room and think, oh, that's cool. And you get up closer and, you know, um, yeah, it's a little clunky, you know, the clunky factor. Or, um, you know, when you're doing those diagrams, I'm fussing with the, 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 those curves that I'm talking about. You know, really getting that curve right. And then once it's on the lathe, really getting it right, whether or not it matches the diagram exactly or not. Off, most times it doesn't, honestly. This one came out pretty close, but most time it doesn't. Look at it and play with it and imagine it different ways before you make those cuts because that's what makes a piece pop or not. You know, do you go uh, all the way down to the bottom uh, when you part it off or do you, you know, leave a nice big chunk of wood there so you're not near your work, you know? Well, then you have a big clunky bottom. I mean, all these issues. So finishing, it's the same thing possibly even more so. So here's Griswold's finishing tips and I could demo it, but I think it's easier to just uh, look it through. <laughs> Go drink a cappuccino. So I mentioned earlier, my wife is a painter and uh, in her uh, work career, her you know, long time professional career before uh, she stopped working after 26 years as uh, she um, to raise the kids and do her own art, she was a paintings conservator, uh, restoring paintings. And she started off early in her career in Italy, in Florence, working uh, at the museum there at the Palazzo Pitti, I think. And um, she was doing, the, you know, she was the, the, the low person on the totem pole and she was doing varnishing on the paintings that they had restored or on the statues that they had restored. And they had this thing where they said, the key to varnishing is go get a cappuccino. Oh meaning put that coat on and stop, stop it. Put your coat on, 
Make sure it looks good. And then put the damn rag down, put the brush down, whatever it is, and go away. <laughs> go take, go drink a cappuccino, come back and look at it. This is how you're going to get to the last 2%. Because what people do when they, what, what do people see when they look at your piece? And I'm thinking like I live, I'm standing across the room and I see the table at the show and tell, or I see the, you know, at a show somewhere. First thing you see is shape. Oh, that's a nice shape. Hmm, cool. You get a little bit closer and then you start to see, you know, the, the pattern on it, the figure, the grain, the color, maybe if it's been decorated, ooh, looking nice. Then the last thing you see when you get up close is the surface. And I can't tell you, I don't know about you guys, but how many times I've gotten up to a piece that was looking really good and there's this sort of wah, wah, wah kind of moment for me anyway. Um, you know, it's just, oh, why did you do that? It's, it is, it's one of the three things that makes your piece what it is. It's the surface. It's, the, it's what the eye looks at. And if it's got drip marks on it, or if it's kind of patchy or there's dust and little dust and you touch it and you feel this sort of lumpy stuff because they finished it in their workshop rather than doing it, you know, upstairs in the bathroom or somewhere where there's no dust, it ruins it. All of that work to slap on. And people say slap on a finish. Well, if you're slapping on finish, I think you're making a big mistake. Um, so how do you get there? I use... It doesn't, it's, I, I just happen to use wipe on poly, the oil base, the water base I tried, I hated it. It just sits on the surface of the wood and it, it looks terrible in my humble opinion. If you wanna see into the wood, you need something that goes into the wood. So wipe on poly, the oil type, Minwax. And then there's a uh, similar compound uh, from England called Liberon, which is also a polyurethane oil mixture, but it's heavier on the oil and I like to use that for the last coat or two. It just, I use this gloss wiping poly, gloss bit of Liberon, and it softens it up really nicely. I put it on with a old cotton t-shirt that's clean. Don't use some dusty rag. I cut little two inch squares out of it. Why do I put two inch squares? Because it stops me from putting too much stuff on there. Wipe it all over. Get the cappuccino, come back maybe the next day, six hours later, two hours later, it all depends on the weather and the temperature and everything, and touch it, feel it, look at it in bright light. If necessary, I do this a lot. It has those little discs of 800 grit, which is pretty much way beyond what you need to actually sand the wood. But oftentimes you feel it and dust is, is settled on it or a little bit of grit or Sometimes I think the, the, the finishes coagulate a little bit. I had the Liberon do that recently. And it was full of these little, and it's all bumpy. You feel it, and then you look at it, and you can actually see it, but you first feel it. Just get 800 grit and just wipe the whole thing down. You don't put any scratches in it, but you get rid of all those little bumps. And then repeat. Get out your another, cut a little two-inch square white, white cotton T-shirt, apply it thinly, go away, come back when it's dry, and do that over and over again, sanding if needed or not, if not needed, until you really like how it's looking. If you over if you over finish it, get out a little thicker grit, sand it back a little bit. You can always you can always reduce the finish again, and then you don't just slap on another another coat and you're back at sort of two coats ago. So you get too many coats, it starts to get too shiny. So there's a little bit of a balancing act there. And then when you're ready, uh, if you want, put on the paste wax or buffing or whatever your last thing is, minus the liver on, and you're good to go. The end. So that's it, folks. And I'll try to get out of this here. Steve, you mentioned liver on. Where do you get the liver on? Yeah, I get it at uh, McBeath in Berkeley. If you're familiar with the place, McBeath, like the like in Shakespeare, Beth with an extra A, McBeath. Yes. Yeah. It's not cheap, but you use it so sparingly. I mean, in fact, the problem is not that I use it up and that it's expensive. So I don't use it fast enough and it starts to go, you know, it starts to get funky on me after a while because the can will easily last me a year or two. So I recently had to decant it through some coffee filters because it was getting this little bits around the rim that did get dry and then drop in there and it was creating these lumps on my pieces. So I just ran it through some coffee filters and put it in small jars. Uh -oh. 
but I love this stuff. It's really nice. I've tried doing just Liberon and I find it gets shiny too fast. After two or three coats, it gets mm -hmm. I don't like that. So somehow the wipe on poly, then finishing with the, the Liberon works really well. Um, I don't think I have any further thoughts. Um, you know, on the, on the finishing, just since that's what we're talking about, what I'm talking about on the advice that Jim Rogers gives, which he gave me years ago. I asked him, what finish should I use? He said, well, it's partly important what you use, but also more important that you pick one and get to know it. So as you can see, I've got a very specific system. And now after these five years or so of working, it works for me. Um, I don't really feel the need to go to anything else. I would like it if I could find something that wasn't, didn't yellow at all. And I tried the, uh, the water-based guys. It doesn't penetrate. It just sits on top of the piece and it doesn't look very nice. So, Hey, Steve, I, yes. are you getting your wipe on poly, the oil one? Where are you getting that? In Nevada? I get the Minwax wipe on poly and I get it at the um, True Value in Walnut Creek. Okay, because I didn't think they were selling oil base anymore. Yeah, let's, um, I mean, it's, it's the oil base, I'm sure. It's available at Ace Hardware stores. Yeah, yeah, Ace and... Okay. Yep. Clear glass. This is actually an old can that I had during those three years I wasn't working, and it went almost solid on me during that time. I don't even know why it's still on my bench, but... Um, Steve, yeah, this is uh, great. I'm sorry, go ahead. Uh, yeah, I was going to ask a question about your steady rest. Did you make that from a plan or did you buy it or what? Uh, where did you get that? Oh, I wish I, I wish I had, but no, there's a guy down in, uh, I don't know, where is it? Kentucky, somewhere in the southeast that uh, you can order them from. He makes them to order. Uh, it's a beautiful piece of craftsmanship. Uh, it's amazing. Uh, truly a lifesaver. If you're working on pieces that are more than you know, six inches out from your tenon, you really want a steady rest. Whether it's a bowl or anything else, I mean, not a platter, obviously, but anything else, it's just, it's a lifesaver. It's, as we all know, such a bummer when that thing flies off the lathe. Clatter, clatter, clatter. <laughs> yeah, know. thank you. Yeah. Hey, Steve, have you ever tried the satin finish wipe on versus the gloss? <laughs> No, I haven't because, I mean, I've talked to people about it and there's two things. One is once you put a coat of that on, your finish is going to be satin, whether you like it or not. You can't put gloss on top of satin because right. the satin does it by putting little flakes of something in there. It wakes up the light and get that satin. So I want to have the control all the way to the end. If I want it more satiny, I'll buff it back a little bit or I will, um, or I used the Liberon. I like the end result. It's just it doesn't really matter how many coats you turn on, when you put on. If you keep putting coat after coat after coat without sanding it back, it's going to get really glossy. Because sometimes I will put many coats because it's drinking up like the really porous like this stuff. If I wanted to get kind of glossy, it's going to take six, seven, eight, nine coats. But I will have to sand it back. Otherwise, what I end up with is sort of a shiny nightmare that's patchy, shiny, and not shiny where it absorbs. So. You can, you can control the gloss to the level you want. Does, it, does the Liberon come in satin and gloss? I don't think so. It's just, it's Liberon finishing oil. It's the specific Liberon. Okay. Yeah. Now, as far as I know, it only comes in that one. They have other products, but I haven't tried them. It's just Liberon finishing oil. Okay. Second question for you. Your uh, shower curtains look nice and clean. <laughs> Mine look awful. Uh, how old, how long have you had those hanging? Since I started uh, turning here. So they, I, it's been about five years worth of turning in here. But, you know, the first three of those were very part-time when I was still on, you know, on the job. And even now I don't work full-time. The, the, wet, the wet wood is what makes them look uh, um, a mess. But it's been the way. It's a good it's, it's, it's feet there from the lathe. I thought they were going to be really staticky, and I bought some bottles of this anti static spray, and it turns out that they're not. I thought all the wood was, all the shavings were sticky. It's the heavy duty curtains, like you know, you get it from the grocery 
buy a warehouse. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Anything else? Well, I hope that was interesting. I hope uh, you're not just rolling your eyes at my diagramming, but I found it. <laughs> Okay, go ahead, roll your eyes, see if I care, Rick. <laughs> no, we had to. <laughs> putting your head down is not going to help. I can see the still the rolling. I was I was looking at the numbers. I've been uh, keeping count as as your talk went along. And we actually gained people in the audience as you went along. Well, they must have heard about this crazy stuff going on, yeah. <laughs> so you got hey, see Steve, this I, have, I have a quick question for you. Yeah, John. When did you get that long hollow pro scraper? I haven't seen that yet. I recently, they, they must have just come out. I got it, I don't know, a month or so ago. Yeah. Yeah. He's added a long uh, scraper and um, something else. I can't remember what, but I didn't need. But uh, I had long thought that that little scraper that first comes with it, it's like the size of your thumbnails. It's just really a pain. Yeah. And that longer scraper gives you a whole bunch more maneuverability. I love it. I would like to see them make a longer set of cutters too. Add an, add an inch onto those cutters would be really nice. It would give you so much more flexibility. Yeah. Is there a scraper for one, from one way tool? The scraper is the, that I use goes with the Tchaikovsky hollowing tools. So you, the, the tools, here's, a, here's the large bent tool. And where am I? Here we go. As you can see at the end, there's a slot so you in, you can change the cutting heads. He's got two um, carbide cutters and the scraper, and now this longer scraper that goes on there. And they all have very different qualities to them. The medium size looks just the same. It's, a, it's um, about half the size. Yeah, in terms so you can see them all. And there's, there's a straight tool that goes with each one of these as well. And then he has these little guys called the rocket tools, which come with the, the carbide cutter built in. And these are just great for the neck of a holoform. Um, or at the beginning when I was showing you my pictures and I had that bowl at the end there, that's uh, in, in, I don't know what the term is, but it's in curve, the top, the top actually comes in. They get underneath there. This is what I used get around just to do a nice little corner under you know, when you're going underneath the edge there. It was great. Um, and then, then I use this, then I use the hollow form uh, with the scraper on it to do the bigger part of the under curve. It's still not ideal. I'm looking at uh, what uh, Kim posted on the um, Bawa Facebook group with his ring tool. And I know John, you use a hook tool. That seems like another good way to get underneath an edge of something. Here we go. Um, but I haven't got one yet. Uh, have you guys? I haven't, those? I haven't sharpened mine yet. It's a little complicated and I'm lazy. So when I get to it, I'll let you know. Please, yeah, post it. Let us know. It looks like a really cool tool. John, I, you I, use a hook book, right? Yeah, is, you, you need, you need to have big uh, open if you're going to use I, a, or a ring tool uh -huh. because they, they create a bunch of spaghetti, really thick uh, shavings. Uh huh. So it, it's not great if you're going to do tight openings. Uh huh. Okay. Someone else. When, was I, when I bought the ring tool that I've got, the same thing. It came with a little grinding stone that uh, is shaped to fit inside of the ring, and you just put it in a drill, low speed, and grind it that way. And it works great. It's oh. a little hard getting used to. It can get a little aggressive, but it's a great tool. Cool. Cool. Yeah, maybe you could. Um, I don't know if you have access to Facebook, but if you could post that on that uh, thread on Facebook, that'd be really cool to see it. I, uh, I'm a new member to the Facebook group. Excellent. You made a com you made a comment on my bowl the other day, Steve, and I appreciate that. I will I will definitely show the tool on Facebook if I can figure out how to get it there. But yeah. it's, just a, it's just a little diamond hone. I mean, not a diamond hone, a little, oh God, triangular hone. You know, it's round and it's just a little triangular hone and it fits right in the ring tool. And I put it on a 
my drill press on a real slow speed and just grind it and it worked great. Mm -hmm. hey, hey Rick, can you, is it possible you could switch it so that when we're in gallery view, it, it just, uh, we can, we'll do. Then you can see who's talking more easily. Okay. Yeah. You're not on the spotlight anymore, so. Great. Okay. Yeah. So speaking of cool about tools, I wanted to mention that one of the crucial pieces on my horizontal tool storage system here is um, this little guy. Uh, John will recognize this uh, since uh, that's where I got it from. This thing is so cool. It's a tenon cutter. And um, John, you'd know what kind of bar this is called. Uh, it is... Uh, three eighths by three eighths by eight inches long, and you just uh, put it, put it on your uh, grinder, and cut the angle that is corresponds to whatever your chuck is. And when it's time to make your tenon, you're done. It's very sweet. Thank you, John. This is like, such a great tip. I love new hey, cools. Hey Steve, one thing that I do is I put a negative rake on it. That just makes it a little less aggressive. Sometimes it can get grabby. Yep, yep. It's funny you say that because I ended up doing that too. I got a little, especially on the tip. Yeah. I got a little, little bit of a negative. Uh, just touched it down there. Yeah. The famous Cobb uh, tenon tool. <laughs> what else? Oh, by the way, here is, I don't know if I showed it in person before, here is what we ended up with. Gorgeous. Gorgeous. It's not like anything I've ever turned before, either the wood or the color or, or the shape. Um, this, uh, this figure is just something. And then and here, I'll show you. As you remember, I showed, told you, when you turn it right side up, Look how that feather comes out, you know? Upside yeah. down. Yeah, it's there, but it's more just sort of streaky. That's that's that little stuff that really is fun, you know? And underneath here, you can see in the white part, there's that fiddleback that we were looking at from the top before. So it's incredibly light. This uh, juniper is very light wood. It's a joy to sand, man. You touch the sandpaper to it and you know, you're done. It's not acacia. <laughs> said, can you, can you, you show that, um, that, uh, that uh, um, piece you use for the dovetail? Could you show that negative great grind that you did on it, how deep it is, perhaps? Well, I just barely touched it on the tip, but I suspect John does more. Okay, can, uh, Rick, can you put it back on yep. the, oh, here, maybe. Yeah, here we go. So there I've just put a little tiny, uh, there, I think you, you can see it shining. Mm -hmm. It's sideways. It's hard to see. Let's see if I hold it up against a piece of paper, maybe. Oh, I see. I see. So it's just at the very tip that you put a negative rake on, rake on it. That's interesting. I did. Maybe John did it on, on both ed cutting edges. I don't know, John. Yeah, I, I put a negative rake on on both of the flanges or the cutting edges. Mm -hmm. uh, just yeah, because because I've had a couple instances where it does get a little little grabby and don't need that. I just want to put it in there and and make a nice cut and and if it takes a second or two longer, that's fine. Absolutely, yeah. I see you have your assistant there. This is the shop dog. This is Joey. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> <Bye. laughs> Steve, is your vase uh, that you turned? Is it dry now or is it still pretty wet? You know, it's pretty dry. It's this this type of wood. You know, the cedars and the these, um, juniper. It's so porous that on the lathe it was drying. In fact, uh, I'm uh, I'm spritzing it with this guy, just a bottle of water the whole time, and. Uh, when I mentioned I was doing this piece to John, he said, ah, did it crack? I've had such bad luck with um, juniper. And of course, this is Hollywood juniper. I don't know how different it is from your regular European juniper. And 
it did crack all the way at the end. Literally, as I was parting it off, I looked down and for the first time I saw there is a tiny, tiny crack, a little hairline crack coming down here. I'm not too upset about it because it's not structural. The piece is done. Um, as I'm gonna let it sit, what I do, I told you I put that finish on it before I hollow it. That's just to give it more integrity. Um, and uh, this is a discussion John Cobb and I have had many times, namely, how do you stop these things cracking while you turn and how do you stop them cracking after you turn them? I have this pet theory of mine and it's just that, which is I slap finish on it from the theory that you know, the oils are going into the wood, it's replacing the water that's coming out, it then dries and it maybe slows down the drying and stabilizes it. We keep saying we're gonna do a side-by-side -side where take the same piece of wood, cut it into pieces, turn two pieces, do one with the oil and one without. Um, John lets his pieces dry till they're dry for final sanding and finishing on his drying rack. I've already put finish on mine when as soon as I take it off the lathe, I put a couple of coats on there. Um, so the way that relates is, you know, we've already got a crack, but even the finish is getting in there into that little crack. I may not even need to CA it. Um, I hope not because the CA might, might show or not, especially in such a porous wood. By the time I've sanded it a little bit more in a week or two or three and put some finish on there, I don't think that the crack's gonna be an issue. But yeah, spritz, spritz bottle is crucial for, for any uh, wood that's you're turning green, green and it's tending, starting to look, if it looks dry, spritz it. That's my philosophy. Any other questions, folks? Well, this was definitely a COVID era demonstration, <laughs> um, an adventure on my part, but uh, kind of fun to take the pictures uh, while I did it. Um, again, I had a little remote control to take the pictures and it seemed to work pretty well. It was terrific. Thank you. You were so well prepared. You told a great story. I think we all loved it. Uh, yeah. thank you. Appreciate yep. it. Well done, Steve. That was good fun. Thank you very much. I enjoyed it very much. Thank you very much, Steve. Thanks, you guys. Thanks. Lucky to have such a community, that's for sure. Hey, thanks, Dave. Great yeah. show. You bet. Thanks. Steve, thank you. My husband's concerned that I now need a horizontal tool rack. <laughs> I told him I have one. <laughs> that's the second garage. The old ancient Dave. <laughs> oh, thanks. You bet. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. Great job. All right. Yeah. Good to see you guys.